evermore. All are too poor to speak His worth, too poor to set my Savior forth. Great prophet of my God, my tongue would bless thy name. By thee the joyful news of our salvation came. The joyful news of sins forgiven, of hell subdued, and peace with heaven. Jesus, my great high priest, offered his blood and died. My guilty conscience seeks no sacrifice beside his powerful blood. Did once atone, and now it pleads before the throne. Thou art my counselor, my pattern, and my guide. And thou, my shepherd, art, O oh, keep me near thy side. Nor let my feet e'er turn astray to wander in the crooked way. My Savior and my Lord, my Conqueror and King, thy scepter and thy sword, thy reigning grace I sing. Thine is the power, behold I sit in willing bonds beneath thy feet. Behold, I sit in willing bonds beneath thy feet. My, what an offensive image it is for you and me to sing that last phrase, to sit in willing bonds beneath thy feet. Having seen the horrors of slavery, having seen how greatly it disrupted the social fabric of this nation, did when it was practiced, still does today, having seen the long-lasting implications and negative fallout from men making slaves of other men, having a nation founded on the principle that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unamiable rights, how offensive it is to use that image of a slave and a Christian in the same context. But slavery was present in the biblical world, and it was an image that the biblical writers used to try to describe the relationship that we have with God. And what is so hard for us to accept is that it is indeed the relationship of a slave to a man. Heaven is not a democracy. Uh, heaven is not subject to a vote. Uh, God's first and foremost priority is not to find out what you want and do his best to give it to you. He does not serve at our beck and call. He's not a cosmic bellhop. He is a king with all authority, authority that we cannot begin to understand nor fathom, sometimes comforting, sometimes terrifying, but he is the authority. As we gather here this day, Another crowd is gathering uh, in Orlando, Florida to mourn the passing of one of God's choice servants. Dr. Mark Stevens is his name, and we knew him well as a teaching colleague. We knew him as someone who ate very carefully and exercised very diligently, took very good care of himself. Probably in the, I mean, he was almost as physically fit as I am. He was just working out so much and doing everything. Seriously, he probably 
one of the top two or three people in terms of physical conditioning we had on our entire faculty. And yet God took him. Sometimes the mastery of God over us is comforting. Sometimes it is terrifying. And there will always be mystery in our interaction with God. For he is sovereign and we are subject. He is master and we are slave. But what we do know with certainty is his indescribable love for us. That he who did not hold back from the cross will not hold back anything in the care for us. And that his grace is always sufficient. Today I'd like us to do a little something different in our prayer time in light of this great tragedy for this family. Death is always a victory for Christians who get to step into glory to the greatest experience of their lives far beyond our ability to conceive. But for those of us who remain, it is always a loss. And this is a shocking loss for a husband and a father of three young girls as they envision a life that's completely changed in one moment in time. So I'd like you to turn to the people next to you and let's get in groups of three or four and let's just lift this family, the Stevens family, up before the Lord and pray for them. And in a moment, I will close our prayers before the Lord. But let us come now and again remind ourselves of God's sovereignty over all things and commit this family into his hands and ask him to comfort and minister to them on what will be a very hard day for them. Would you join me, please, as we pray? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we ask you to hear our cries in support of our seminary family. We pray for Natalie Stevens, we pray for her three daughters, and we lift them up before you and ask you this day to love on them, to fill them full of your presence, to undergird them with your grace. We pray for those who will them this day conducting the funeral service, those who will be present, who will be speaking with them. We pray that all of those who come in contact this day will have just the right word to say who will speak just the right word of comfort and help. And we pray that they will experience some of the greatest encouragement they've ever had in the midst of this unspeakable sorrow. Father, we also lift up ourselves before you for we've had this vivid reminder that our times are in your hands and that not one of us knows which will be his last day, his last day to love a wife, his last day to love on children, his last day to serve you, his last day to live a completely, totally surrendered life to you. We know you've given us this day, Father. We pray that you would help us to take the gift of this day and to use it for your glory. To so live this day in obedience
to you to so live this day in our relationships with family and friends, to so live this day in every aspect that when we get to the end of it, we will not regret one minute of it. And we will have known at the end of this day, we lived it all out for your glory and for the good of your kingdom and for the strengthening of our relationships. Thank you again for sustaining grace. Thank you again for the great hope of the glory that awaits, knowing that every story of a Christian has a happy, wonderful ending. Wow, what a gift, what a precious gift that is in a world of uncertainty. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen and amen. Before you sit down, just remind the folks around you, shake a hand or two, remind people, live well today. Would you do that? Thank you so very much. We do welcome you to this time of worship and praise on the campus of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. It is our normal chapel service, and we are praying for the Stevens family, especially today and tomorrow in their loss. But we are also gathering before God for him to hear our praise and our adoration as we sing and as we pray. And just be reminded that he is so important in our lives, we want to set aside this part of this day just to give him glory. We also want to set aside this time for us to hear his voice. Our preacher for the day is Dr. John Gibson. Dr. Gibson has a long family heritage that goes back in this school. His father was a classmate with my predecessor, Dr. Landrum Level, and the Gibsons have been intimately involved with New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary for a very long time. He has two degrees in this institution, a master's degree and a doctoral degree. He's been faculty of Level College for a number of years in the area of preaching and pastoral work uh, and speech, and we're so very grateful for his presence with us. John always has a smile on his face. He's always just on the edge of a laugh, and he's always got a funny story, and the really neat thing, you never know when he's going to show up in a wig. It's just a delight to have John and his sweet family as a part of our seminary family. We're going to have another time of worship, and then God has given him a word for us. He will open God's word and share that word after our time of worship. Continuing our theme, our, our looking at surrender, what it means to be surrendered to the Lord, a slave of the Master. Let's sing together, I give my heart. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give you praise. All that I adore is in you. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give you. Praise all that I adore 
is in you. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me, have your way in me. Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Let's stand together and sing. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want you forever to ransom my soul. Break down every idol. Cast out every foe, now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow, whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, before you I patiently wait. Come now, and within me a new heart create. To those who have sought you, you never said no. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me. Have your way in me. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, for those kind words. It is always easy to have a smile on my face because when you were raised by the
that I had, you never knew what was going to happen. I broke my nose four times playing college football. Uh, well, actually, twice in high school and then twice in college. And 15 or 16 years old, I've got this deviated septum, dog leg curved to the left nose. I can take my senior picture and look and see the nose over here and the face here. And, you know, that was really a debilitating thing and affected my psychological well-being, as you can well tell. And when I finished college football, Dad's offered this uh, uh, plastic surgery. He said, you're still on the insurance. We can fix your nose, and you can be better looking. You can breathe. You see, in high school, I had trouble with breathing and de deviated septum. I, I would have a nosebleed at an unexpected moment. With this deviated septum in the prime of my dating career, at the age of 16, I would go to the door and kiss this girl goodnight, and she would mash my good nostrils shut. And if I wanted to kiss for longer than five seconds, I'd have to call time out to read, you know, so it was a real difficult thing. Well, Dad paid for the, or uh, arranged for the surgery. The plastic surgeon said, we can go in and straighten your nose. We'll take the rib out of the side and put it up here in your nose, and you'll have stronger structure, and you'll be able to do just fine. Came out of that surgery, the insurance company sends a note back. We've judged this surgery to have been cosmetic. $3,500 is payable upon due to uh, receiving this uh, bill. And Dad said, I ain't got $3,500. So he took a black and white picture of me before and after and penned the following letter. The boy was ugly when he went in, and he's ugly when he came out. We think you ought to pay the bill. And they did. And so um, I'm in great shape. Well, the matter at hand we have, the psalmist has written from David's heart and life, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I'd like to talk with me for a few moments today about a brand new heart. Let's pray. Father, I ask that the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth can be acceptable in your sight. And I pray that we can hear your servant David beg and plead, for that brand new heart. These things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. My uncle, Captain Richard P. Boyle, had served two, year, or two different tours of duty in Vietnam. He came home to work for General Electric in Columbus, Ohio for a number of years and began to have difficulty with his heart. The heart doctor told him in 1987, your heart is diseased, you will not live another year, we'll put you on a transplant list and hope and pray that you will receive a new heart. Well, that new heart came. An accident victim in nearby uh, Cincinnati had his heart harvested from his uh, uh, dead body and was taken up and implanted in my uncle's uh, body. And for 10 more years, Uncle Dick lived a full and fruitful life and then died and was called home to heaven. He needed a new heart, but the one he got was basically a rebuilt heart or one that had already been used. In our passage, David cries out to God to give him a clean heart, to create one in him that had not been a retread, that was not made of used parts, something brand new. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, Nathan the prophet is told by the Lord to go and confront King David with his sin and the multitude of breaking of the Ten Commandments that David had had. Faced with that guilt and the penalty and the weight of sin, David is driven to his knees to beg for forgiveness and ask God for a brand new heart. You and I need brand new hearts. We're ministering to people in a world that willingly embrace sin and take it on and carry it. And our job is ministry find a way to show people to the cross where they can leave their burdens there. I find three aspects in this passage of Scripture that everybody needs a brand new heart, but only God can give you a brand new heart. But lastly, a brand new heart leads you to a brand new way of life. I think of this first aspect, that everybody needs a brand new heart. Nathan was told to go and meet with David, go and confront him with his sin and the, the results that would fall out and consequences that would come from this sin. I've often wondered, though Nathan was going at David's direction or God's direction, could it be the same argument that Ananias had when God told him to go and lay his hands on Saul who was blind up in Damascus? Would Nathan have said, you're sending me into the king of this nation. He is very powerful. He's already sinned greatly. What if he kills me when I go in to visit with him?
Imagine that God told Nathan, you just go and do what I tell you and leave the results to me. Nathan goes in and confronts him and David understands his sin and feels utterly and totally worthless. And I would imagine that David probably also felt unloved and never being able to serve God again in any capacity. David realized how unfaithful to the Lord he had been and with this in mind he came to the spot where we are in Psalm 51 verses 10 through 12. You know, I think about what sin does to you and me, that we are confronted with it, realize that we have carried something that God never intended for us to carry. God intends for us to do business on a daily basis with Him and come before Him and, and share our, our difficulties and our problems and our, our faults and say, Lord, I, I've done this, would you please forgive me? Instead, some of us go through a week or a month or, or a longer time frame and, and sweep this under the rug thinking no one will ever notice. Maybe it's like that guy who uh, incorrectly reported it is his income tax, and he wrote the following letter, I've not been able to sleep for the past three weeks because I incorrectly reported the amount that I owe you on my income tax. Enclosed is a check for $250. If I'm unable to sleep for the next two weeks, I'll send the remaining uh, amount that I owe. Sometimes people are like that, that we think maybe we can pay a little bit of lip service or just a bit, and maybe it will go away. In verse 6, David identifies what God's desire for you and me is. He says, Behold, you desire truth in my inmost being, and in the hidden part you make me to know wisdom. You know, God's desire is that we know Him in His fullness, that we know Him in His truth and know Him in His blamelessness and His holiness. And that's where He calls us to come and join Him in that holiness. Remember what happened to Adam and Eve when they thought that they could run from their sin and go and hide and, and maybe it would disappear or go away. I wonder why David didn't run or maybe disappear. But David realized that his heart needed to be cleaned. He needed that brand new heart. And when he speaks of that, he, he goes to his knees and says, Lord, create in me a clean heart. When he utters those words in verse 10, he tells us that God is the only one that can give him a new heart. There is no self-help book around to be able to turn this around. There's nothing out there that this world has to offer. The word create... It, is the, the word the translators tell me that means to create out, uh, create out of nothing. I'm a jack leg mechanic, and I've gone to AutoZone and Pep Boys two or three times this year, and I've taken an alternator off a car. I've taken a, a, a other parts off of a car, and you go and you turn it in, and they say, like a new one or a rebuilt one? And I said, what's the difference? And they quote the price. I think I want a rebuilt one. I don't think I want to pay for a new one. And they'll say, you'll be back to see us. And you know, nine times out of ten, they're right, because that rebuilt one's going to short out later on, and I'm going to come back and get the new one that I originally wanted. David didn't want to go to AutoZone and get a rebuilt heart. He wanted a brand new one, one that was clean, one that had been sanctified, sent directly from the throne room of God. Being a, a son of an English teacher, mom taught English for 37 years, real big on diagramming sentences. I see the verb, I know the implied subject is God himself. I see the direct object, heart, but I see the indirect object in me. David's not asking for you to get a clean heart today. He's asking for himself to have that clean heart because that's where the business is. He draws that circle around himself and realizes he the clean heart. There's no doubt. In verses 7 and 8, he says, Purge me with hyssop, a strong aromatic perfume. One commentator says that this is used to spray the leper so that it would cover the stench of the uh, malady that is there. You and I take a bath and use soap and spray ourselves down with colognes and perfumes and things of the kind to make ourselves presentable. David says, also make me presentable in your sight. I like the fact that he says in verse 10, renew in me, renew. We have a good friend at First Baptist Church, Bill Nix, an airline pilot for Delta. Bill Nix has a sideline. He likes to go find British MGs, cars that have been either wrecked or abandoned and buys the bodies of those cars. Some of them are in great shape, and all he's got to do is do a little bit and rebuilds that thing, and 
sells a brand new car. Some others have been sitting out in the junkyard and have gotten uh, uh, the corrosion and, and the aging that comes with having something sit outside. But you see what Bill Nix does to a car and you think, can he do that for me? You know what he does? He makes his kids build their own car. He said, I'm not buying you one, you build one. I need to do that at my house. That'd save me some money, you know. They can build it, but we're not building MGs. We're going to build something cheap, like a Chevrolet or a Pontiac or something like that. It's a little more affordable. David doesn't want a Pontiac. He wants a Cadillac. He wants the best that God can give him. He says, renew in me a steadfast spirit that will be firm and unwavering, that won't be able to be pushed by the winds of temptation. We ought not be like Flip Wilson and have the character. I'm aging myself by mentioning him. But the devil made me do it. David says, let me be inhabited by God's Spirit so that I can have this brand new heart that will no longer wander or waver. I find it interesting in verse 11, he says, cast me not away from thy presence. I wonder if when David prays this, if he's not thinking of Cain after the murder of Abel. And God sent Cain away. I wonder what's worse, to be killed as a result of committing the felony crime of death, or is it worse to be sent away and be marked so that everywhere you go, somebody knows what you have done, and that they will not have fellowship with you. They will not enjoy your presence. They will not invite you in. Cast me not away from thy presence. Lord, I don't care if you make me scrub the floors. Don't send me away. And then the next phrase, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I wonder if he thought of his predecessor, Saul, who specifically said, I have taken my spirit from Saul. Oh, Lord, don't leave me alone. Don't leave me without your guidance and your your special whisper. Please don't take that away. Don't send me away and don't leave me alone. Long time ago when we were on a vacation in uh, Canada, my mom and dad stopped at a hamburger place and my little brother and I uh, said we needed to go to the bathroom and we went to this, uh, it was a a very run-down hamburger joint, typical of my dad to take us to about a 15-cent hamburger place. But anyway, we went back there and the door was uh, in bad need of being planed down. And so my brother and I went in and took care of business and then we realized that the door was stuck and we couldn't open it. And we began to cry and wail And what I didn't know is that there was a a way that the bathroom was picking up our way and it was carrying out into the restaurant. And my mom and dad thought, why didn't somebody hush those kids up? Man, they're disturbing our eating. Where in the world are they? And finally, daddy realized that we weren't there, came back there and knocked the door open. Baron and I had taken a, a bar of soap to try to wedge it open. Soap doesn't work, I assure you. It broke in two. We were in prison. We were in jail. We wanted to be with our parents. We didn't want to be separated from them. And David wanted to be in the presence of God. So everybody needs a brand new heart. And only God can give you a brand new heart. But a brand new heart can lead to a brand new life. You see, David didn't want to stay in the rut that he was in. He didn't want to be in this sin forever. You know, I've often wondered, how long did David go before he thought, I'm going to break if I don't tell somebody what I've done? Why wait on Nathan to come in? Why not go ahead and tell God, I've done this? I wonder which is prison, carrying and hiding the sin and then finding a worse reprimand or going ahead and coming clean and saying, this is what I've done and letting the chips fall where they may. The new heart can lead to a brand new life. He says, restore unto me. Bring me back to my formal state of usefulness. Make me be able to do what I used to be able to do. Restore unto me the joy. I suspect that there are many Christians who have lost the joy, the the, the song that makes them uh, move and are motivated and enjoy being in the ministry. You know, sometimes I wonder if Moses did not pine for going back to shepherding the sheep instead of messing with a million Israelis. I mean, you have all of those people asking you, are you there yet? Can't you get us some water? This quail's not being cooked right, Moses. I don't like this manna. I need something else. And I'm most of all tired of the same old 
Moses all the time. You know, I wonder if Moses wanted to say, give me my old job back. The joy of my salvation. The salvation, I hope and pray, and David, I think, is asking for this, that the salvation that we are given would never, ever, ever be old. That it would always be new each and every day. Just finished preaching through Revelation over in the interim in Purlington, Mississippi, and in Revelation 22 or 21, I'm amazed by the imagery in the uh, holy city that at every gate there is a pearl. A pearl. It's not original with me, but I've uh, discovered and, and been thrilled by the possibility that that pearl is there to remind us of the sacrifice and suffering that comes with making a pearl, but the sacrifice and suffering that Jesus did to give us our salvation, that in heaven for all of eternity we'll be able to say, thank you, thank you, thank you for this salvation and never ever forget how we got here. And I think that's what David is asking for. He says, uphold me or sustain me there in verse 12. Sustain me with that willing spirit. Hold me up and give me support. My mind is thinking of Moses when his hands got tired that people came and held his arms up. Uphold me with a willing spirit. Allow me to want to do this. And so David prays a very simple, direct prayer, asking for that brand new heart to give him that new life. And then he says in verse 13, Then I'll get back to doing what I should have been doing all along, teaching transgressors the righteousness of God and allowing them to come to conversion in Christ. I wonder how many we have turned away from the cause of Christ because we haven't taken care of our own backyard and our own personal heart and people have seen in us. Have people said, I don't want to be that if that's what a Christian can do. Maybe the Indian word picture that I read several years ago that inside of his is a conscience that is shaped like a triangle. And that triangle turns every time we do something wrong. And the points of the triangle prick our conscience. And when our conscience hurts, it snaps us awake and realizes that we need to be in that confessional mode with the Lord. But the more that triangle turns, the more we wear that point down, it becomes rounded off and no longer do we hear, feel, or sense the conscience that is there. And I think David wants to be able to maintain that sensitivity that when he's wrong, he wants an alarm bell to go off very, very quickly. So instead of being the transgressor, let me help transgressors find your way. Maybe as David finds this new life, he can look at this psalm in a different way. You and I could read it and say, Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew in us a steadfast spirit. Do not cast us from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from us, and restore unto us the joy of your salvation, and sustain us with your willing spirit. Then we will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. That's what the church of the living God is supposed to do, is to move like an army, making a difference in changing lives and making people understand the relationship with the Lord. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the presence that we feel from your throne of grace. And I ask that within each of us, we can you do business with us like you did with David, that you want us to come clean. You want to renew that right spirit so that we can serve you with fervor and gladness, but most of all, being a clean instrument in your hand. Bless the activities of this day and give us your wisdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.